1866, when DePaul was known as Indiana Asbury, and about 11 years before this drawing was created of the Wabash campus, the two institutions battled for the first time on the baseball field. When it comes to football, history books suggest DePaul played Butler in 1880 and lost. A brief account in Asbury Monthly described it as a disastrous defeat. In 1884, DePaul and Wabash each played one game against Butler, with Wabash winning and DePaul losing. The DePaul squad was so forlorn, it took out an ad in the student newspaper offering to sell its football on the cheap. It would be 1889 before DePaul would play another official game. This is the team photo from that year. While their soon-to-be rivals played three games in 1886, one in 87, and like DePaul, two in 89. This is an illustration of the Greencastle campus in 1890. Even before the first snap in this series, on Greencastle street corners, there was late 19th century trash talk. DePaul's record asked, is there a college in this state by the name of Wabash and has it a football team? The first scoring came when DePaul forced a Wabash safety. DePaul halfback John Miner scored the series' first ever touchdown and the final score on a beautiful day was 34 to 5 in favor of the visitors. The class that would graduate in the spring of 1891 returned to the Greencastle campus for their reunion 30 years later as the first to ever witness a DePaul Wabash football scrape. Installation of a new underwater cable in 1891 allowed the first telephone conversations between London and Paris. The first traveler's checks were issued, and 43% of DePaul students were women. Legendary DePaul professor Joseph P. Naylor joined the Department of Physics in 1891, while the campus newspaper reported a photographer named Kerr had taken a great shot of the football team. But these men would not have a face-to-face -face meeting with the squad from Wabash. The gripe from Greencastle was that one of the Wabash players was not a student at the college. On November 20th, the day before the scheduled game, the manager of the Crimson team sent a telegram south announcing that his group could not play and would forfeit the contest. But there would be other things to see. Days later in Springfield, Massachusetts, James Naismith took a soccer ball and a peach basket into a gym and invented the game of basketball. Early newspaper reports typically listed the heavier team as favorites heading into a football game, and the DePaul men, averaging 180 pounds each, were given the edge in 1892. For the record, this guy, right tackle Jerry Simpson, tipped the scales at 168. The game must have been a big deal. DePaul's Philadelphian Literary Society postponed its meeting on account of it. A train carrying the Wabash team and about 30 other students from the college arrived in Greencastle at 2.20 p.m. and the kickoff took place an hour and 10 minutes later. Where on campus it was played is a mystery. A report says there was a decided slope on the grounds to the north goal. It was all downhill for Wabash after their rivals scored early and often in a 42-4 run. Photographs allow us to take a trip back in time to a DePaul laboratory and to peek at the cover of an 1893 syllabus for the course Economics, Money and Banking. This is the DePaul team that made the trip to Crawfordsville for the fourth edition of this nascent rivalry. The morning of the contest, Wabash students and faculty built a fence around Philistine Field in hopes of boosting attendance. It worked. 200 DePaul fans bought tickets that afternoon. When he wasn't posing with a bale of hay, DePaul captain Arthur Whitcomb was a force. He scored at least two touchdowns and kicked eight extra points in the 1893 game. Other touchdowns were registered by his equally dapper teammates, E.W. Albright and Jack Kuykendall. The visitors led 36 to 22 at the half, and each team scored 12 points in the second stanza. A boastful DePaul newspaper summary of the game likened Wabash to a defeated campaign rooster and suggested that the Crawfordsville mayor knew he was safe when he told the Wabash team before the game, boys, if you win, you can have the city. In 
In cities and towns across America, indignation toward the game of football was growing in 1894. Fist fights, free for alls, non students playing for colleges, and a number of deaths on playing fields led some schools to scrap their teams, and the dangerous formation known as the Flying Wedge was outlawed. DePaul's student journalists added to the debate, a front page item in the January 23rd DePaul Weekly examined the sport's future and asked, Has football dug its grave? By fall, the patient was still up and around. Here's a look at the 1894 Wabash team. And this is a stunning shot from the DePaul Rose Poly game played in November. It's not clear where at DePaul the contest with Wabash was played. Photos from the era suggest East College Lawn may have been a venue. For the first time in five meetings, the men from Crawfordsville would prevail, led by hard-hitting fullback John Fry, the captain of the Scarlet team. DePauw had a school of military science and tactics in 1895. Its activities included firing cannons on East College lawn. The university opened its own athletic facility, McKean Field, that year. This shows the baseball team at play there. And this image depicts the candidates for the track team. The yearbook lists 16 players on the football team's roster, but the squad was no match for Wabash, led by fullback Albert Babe Ristine and the eventual state champion. 500 fans witnessed a 6-0 victory for the footballers from Crawfordsville. A week later, DePaul lost to Missouri, then went on to beat and tie Indiana University in consecutive contests. The Wabash College Athletic Association, which was run by students, was in debt, and the football team played only five games in 1896, winning just one. The DePaul team, seen here, had an early and rough scrape with an athletic club from Louisville, which turned out to be a group of, according to one account, hardened professionals. A story in DePaul's student newspaper was headlined, Rotten. It reported that a Louisville player pulled a gun during the scrimmage and relayed a final score of 26 points for cigarettes, brute force, and foul play against 12 for science, self-control, and manhood. Three weeks later, the women of DePaul's Alpha Chi Omega chapter were among those gathered for the game with Wabash. The editors of the DePaul Weekly predicted the Tigers would shut out their rivals, and they were spot on. A veteran DePaul team logged a 20-0 victory. In 1897, William McKinley was inaugurated as America's 25th president, and the first Boston Marathon was run. 1898 saw the sale of the first auto insurance policy in the U.S., and an automobile speed record of 39 miles per hour was set. Among the items patented in 1899 were the rubber heel, aspirin, and the lawnmower. But the DePaul-Wabash football rivalry sat dormant during those three years. As a new century dawned, this is a look at the first National Bank of Greencastle in 1900, the two schools made up for lost time by scheduling a pair of games, and the series' first prankster emerged. A week prior to the first wabash DePaul game, a man came to Greencastle claiming to be an Indianapolis newspaper reporter. He got permission to sit on the Tiger bench on game day to ensure his write-up would be comprehensive. Some journalist this guy turned out to be he was Wabash head coach Anthony Chez. The very next week, in a game played not far from this Wabash classroom, the home team's scouting paid off with a 6-0 victory. Wabash scored its touchdown three minutes before the game was over. Five weeks later at DePaul, a different outcome. The Tigers prevailed 26-11 in a game that was called on account of darkness 12 minutes into the second half. Chez would sit on the DePaul bench the entire next season. He left Wabash to coach their rivals before the 1901 campaign began. On October 12, 1901, what had been known as the Executive Mansion got a new moniker. As President Theodore Roosevelt renamed this place the White House. As the weather turned chillier in Greencastle, a local merchant launched a $7 overcoat sale. 
Like the season before, the two teams played two games in 1901. This is the Wabash team photo. They took place on consecutive Mondays, with the first at DePauw's McKean Field. The Greencastle banner wrote a song to get DePauw fans worked up. Sung to the tune of Marching Through Georgia, it began, Come ye men of DPU, assemble on McKean. It will be the very toughest game Wabash has ever seen. They were seemingly prophetic words, as a strong running game gave the Tigers two victories. And Greencastle had a third reason to celebrate that fall, as word arrived that free mail delivery would soon begin in the city. DePauw fans had bragging rights headed into the 1902 game and were begging for more, but there would be no contest with Wabash that fall. A year later, when the two teams renewed their growing rivalry in Crawfordsville, classrooms emptied and the library had plenty of free seats. Tiger coach Chauncey Berrien and his team were 2-5-1 entering the final game, having been drubbed by Indiana 70-0 the week before. Coach Tug Wilson and his Wabash squad were 8-2 against opponents, which included two high school teams. And the men in Scarlet schooled their rivals from DePaul in the 1903 clash, 10-0. Wabash ended its season the following weekend with a 34-0 loss to Notre Dame. On November 4, 1904, Harvard Stadium, the first facility built specifically for football, opened. Five days later, courtesy of the Wright brothers, came the first airplane flight to last more than five minutes. The 04 Wabash football team was the first to be known as Little Giants. Coach Francis Caillou commented that his scrappy team was made up of good little men. That became Little Giants in newspaper reports. Here's a look at the DePauw team in a year in which there would be no rivalry game. After much back and forth, the two teams could not agree on a date for a contest and finally gave up the talks just before Thanksgiving weekend. The 1905 DePauw team was led by Fred Tucker, the subject of this flattering yearbook cartoon, and the Tigers had a new coach, O.H. Luck. But the team's luck wasn't very good when they faced off against Wabash in late November. The Giants were huge, racking up 577 yards of offense to their opponents 198, winning in a run. <music> Symbols of Greencastle, the town square and East College are familiar sights as we look back upon 1906. Although classrooms had a different look then, vintage photos also show the university's physics club, fencing society, oratorical association, and preacher's club. Prayers couldn't hurt the football team. DePaul opened its 1906 season by thumping Franklin, this is a shot from that game, 81-6, but went on to lose by a combined 88-0 to Michigan State and Indiana. Wabash sold a big bunch of tickets to the rivalry game at its chapel before that Saturday, and at least 75 rooters paid a dollar apiece to ride the Monon to Greencastle. The Little Giants had beaten Purdue, and pundits were prognosticating that the Wabash offense would rack up as many as 50 points against DePauw. But wet, miserable conditions made this a defensive struggle. We're looking at a photo from the 1906 game. Charles Jewett, who would later become mayor of Indianapolis, was disqualified for unnecessary roughness, and even All-American honorable mention Fred Tucker couldn't save the day as the Tigers walked off McKean Field with another loss. Happy New Year! 1907 began with a new world record. On January 1st, President Theodore Roosevelt shook 8,513 hands in one day. On October 22nd of that year, Ringling Brothers, boasting the greatest show on earth, bought the Barnum and Bailey Circus. About two and a half weeks later, another edition of small college football's big show came to Crawfordsville. The 225 DePaul fans who made the trip arrived chanting, Wahoo, Wahoo, Rip, Zip, Bazoo, as they marched four abreast to Ingalls Field. Wabash scored a touchdown, two drop kicks, and a safety to claim an 11-4 victory. 
The Tigers may have surprised the favored Little Giants with a close game, but they still went home with a loss. As the fall of 1908 arrived, West College and the other buildings on the DePaul campus welcomed a new addition. Greencastle's Andrew Carnegie Library was dedicated in October, something students likely wrote home about on this vintage postcard. The Tigers were 4-2 and two heading into their last game of the season with Wabash. The Little Giants with new head coach Ralph Jones, who had been successfully leading the basketball program, were 1-5 and five, coming off an 8-4 to four loss to Notre Dame. On a Friday in November, 350 DePauw students made the train trip to Crawfordsville, where the total crowd was estimated at 1,000. This is a photo from the 1908 game. It was scoreless until the second half, when a pair of touchdowns by Wabash's James Herc, short for Hercules, Steers, determined the outcome. A 12-0 victory for the home team. This panoramic photo from 1909 gives us a glimpse of the Wabash College campus in another era. It was a year when the football team got off to a 2-3 and three start before the game with its rivals to the south. A Wabash graduate became the new grid coach and helped reshape the game. Jesse Harper was an early proponent of the forward pass. A DePauw team boasting names such as Hop Overman, Kinks Hawthorne, and War Horse Sellers had only played one game, a 28-5 loss to Indiana before the rivalry contest. Three days before kickoff, the DePaul student newspaper chastised a Crawfordsville columnist for his pipe dream after predicting a 60-0 Little Giants win. In a battle waged just a few blocks from bustling Washington Street, this DePaul team held tough and proved the columnist's optimism wrong. When it was over, the DePaul paper went so far as to characterize the scoreless outcome as a Tiger victory. As a new decade began on the DePaul campus, a new symbol was put in place. The ornamental gateway which leads to East College was a gift of the class of 1890 at their 20th reunion in 1910. At Wabash, a 4-0 start by the football team, all wins by shutout, came to a sudden and tragic end when Ralph Sapp Wilson died from injuries he sustained in the Little Giants' win over St. Louis. While football continued to be played at DePauw, Wabash canceled the rest of its season. The question etched on Wilson's tombstone would have to wait another year for an answer. In October of 1911, the rivalry resumed, with DePaul supporters offered a $1 train ticket to see the Friday game in Crawfordsville. The story was what did not happen. Wabash's Skeet Lambert uncharacteristically missed all seven drop kicks he attempted, and with time expiring, his teammate Ralph Markle was hit and fumbled the ball three yards away from the goal line. DePaul coach Cotton Burnt cheered as his team recovered the loose pigskin sealing another scoreless outcome. In September 1912, as a new school year began, George Richmond Groves was appointed DePaul's 10th president. A month later, alumni who returned to the university for Old Gold Day at McKean Field went home stunned. Wabash quarterback Skeet Lambert was a one-man wrecking crew, scoring five touchdowns and was successful on a like number of extra points. His brother Ward, also a Wabash man, would later coach Purdue to 11 Big Ten basketball titles. Raymond Williams added three TDs of his own. One went 60 yards, another 50. DePaul never came close to the goal line. Wabash's 5-2 season was the last for coach Jesse Harper, who left to take the reins of Notre Dame's football program and brought the forward pass to the Fighting Irish just in time for Newt Rockney's senior year. On October 7, 1913, Henry Ford launched the first large-scale moving assembly line to produce his Model T. 
College students had something else to celebrate that fall. 13 days later, an excursion train took DePaul fans to Crawfordsville for an early season battle between coach Tom Bogle's 1-1-1 Tigers and the 0-1-1 Little Giants. The crowd was described as large and loud. It engaged in a howling contest before the opening kickoff. They played in raw, windy weather conditions and for the first time on a Monday. In the second quarter, DePaul had a fourth down on Wabash's 10-yard line. Halfback Gordon Thomas grabbed a delayed pass, scampered toward Paydirt, but was hit as he reached the goal line and fumbled the football. Five Scarlet players made a dive for the precious bounty, but Tiger fullback Hank Rowan gathered it in for the game's lone score. It was the first triumph for the black and gold since 1901. University of Michigan fans who held a 1914 season ticket package were among 5,100 people who saw a season opener pitting the maize and blue against the Tigers from DePauw. The result, as the New York Times noted, was a 58-0 drubbing fueled by a spate of successful trick plays by the Wolverines. All-American halfback John Malbesh, a future college football Hall of Famer, starred for the home team. Led by Captain Gordon Thomas, DePaul entered the Wabash game with a 3-4 and four record, while their foes were 5-1. and one. Another Monday afternoon game, this battle at McKean Field was scoreless until the fourth quarter, and the game-breaker was DePaul halfback Hank Rowan. His drop kick from the 25-yard line late in the game was the difference, as DePaul shut out its rivals for a second consecutive year. Six months after the fifth Indianapolis 500, which took more than five and a half hours to complete and an average speed of 89 miles per hour, fans of the Wabash DePaul football rivalry looked at the capital city as a new host for their game. The idea was moving the contest to Indy would allow more fans to attend. DePaul's student newspaper called upon lusty voiced supporters to show up in large numbers. As became a tradition, a large contingent marched through downtown Indianapolis west to Washington Park. A reserved seat was $2, a buck less than it cost to see the World Series that fall. In an article summarizing the 1915 game, the DePaul wrote, The less that is said, the better. It was 13-0 Wabash through three quarters, but in his one and only year as the Tigers head coach, Ralph Young watched the Bengals get mauled by the undefeated Little Giants. As the headline reads, 34-0 was the final pileup. Nineteen sixteen brought changes to the DePaul campus as groundbreaking was held for a new women's dormitory, Rector Hall, and the university dedicated its brand new Bowman Gymnasium. Wabash fans were giddy coming off a win in the big game the year before, and they were building for the future with a team that featured freshman right tackle Raymond Gaumy Neal. Four days after Woodrow Wilson was narrowly re-elected president, fans of both teams gathered in Indianapolis for the annual grudge match. They marched downtown. This is the Wabash contingent. Here's DePause and they produced plenty of noise for a game that newspapers predicted would be a battle to remember. Both squads came to Washington Park with four and two records, but on this day, Wabash fullback Francis Bacon provided the sizzle. He scored three touchdowns in a back-and-forth struggle that ended with the Little Giants winners by 13. On April 6, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson signed the bill formally declaring war against Germany and the United States entered the conflict in Europe. Six months later, women suffragists paraded down New York's Fifth Avenue carrying the signatures of a million females demanding the right to vote. Also that fall, DePauw dedicated its new women's dormitory, Rector Hall, and the faculty considered a plan to hold classes six days a week. This is an actual stub from the 1917 DePaul Wabash football game, and a $1.50 seat at Washington Park in Indianapolis provided a view of a tough battle. 
A first quarter 15 yard touchdown pass from DePaul's Dick Wheat to Joe Royce and a successful extra point summed up the day's scoring, although a later Wabash drive was stopped at the one yard line. In the fall of 1918, student army training continued on college campuses like DePauze as the Great War in Europe was winding down. But a new threat arrived, a worldwide influenza pandemic, which peaked in late October and eventually killed more than 60 million people across the globe, including more than a half million Americans, exceeding the nation's total casualties in World War I. Health-related bans on public assemblies meant many football games were canceled, and restrictions in Indianapolis forced the 1918 DePaul Wabash contest to be moved to Crawfordsville. On November 11th in Greencastle's town square, a huge crowd celebrated Armistice Day, the symbolic end of the war. Twelve days later, trains delivered fans to Wabash for a game described by the Indianapolis Star as a walloping. In this skirmish, an early touchdown run by Buddy O'Neill got DePaul rolling. He later returned an interception 60 yards for a score. An abbreviated season ends with a 28-6 Tiger victory. It was the year DePaul welcomed its first Rector Scholars, and which spotlighted two future legends. Pete Vaughn became Wabash's head coach. His star player, senior Raymond Gaumey Neal, would later become the opposing coach in this rivalry. And students made no bones about it. Even then, a look up or down the Monon line could get them carried away. Tiger fans who made the road trip to Indianapolis for the 1919 game gathered on Monument Circle for a sizable rally before parading to Washington Park. A treasure trove of images are available from the contest, which drew a crowd of 7,000 to the stadium just west of downtown. But the scoreboard operators saw no action. The closest either team came to scoring was when DePaul's Harold Galloway returned a punt 60 yards and was pulled down at the Wabash 30. The story and the team's seasons don't end there, there was a post-game dance downtown, health problems incapacitated DePaul head coach Edward Buss, and four alumni from Indianapolis, including the city's mayor, Charles Jewett, took over the football team for the remainder of the season, which ended with a 2-5-1 record. Wabash's football annual summarized a 4-3-2 campaign. DePaul started a new decade by preparing for the 1920 season at a new site. Culver Military Academy became the Tigers' training camp. But during those September workouts, Hugh Gibbs suffered a spinal injury and died several days later. After an opening loss to Purdue on October 2nd, DePaul won four straight, including a game which Valparaiso decided to forfeit in the third quarter. It was scoreless with DePaul on their two-yard line when it was stopped to avoid the touchdown that was sure to follow, read a newspaper account. Pete Vaughn's Wabash team was 3-2 before the DePaul battle, which was again played at Indianapolis's Washington Park. It was scoreless until about a minute remained in the game. That's when Tiger quarterback Harold Galloping Galloway attempted a drop kick, which went squarely through the Wabash goalposts 52 yards away. In March of 1921, DePaul's entire student body gathered to break ground for a new athletic facility, Blackstock Field, to be named for its benefactors, 1886 graduate and trustee Ira Blackstock and his wife. Here's a closer look at the original design. By summer, a new football coach, Fred Walker, was in place. He guided the team to a 4-2 and two record before the Wabash game. Photos exist from the two skirmishes the Tigers lost to Notre Dame and Illinois, but their six triumphs included a 67-0 thumping of Kentucky's Georgetown, depicted here. 
Wabash was 6-1 with two foes remaining, DuPaul and Marquette, losing only to national powerhouse Army. This shows the Little Giants' 9-0 triumph over Purdue. With four future school Hall of Famers on the team, the men in red had outscored opponents 123-24. It had rained all week and the field was muddy as more than 8,000 fans gathered at Washington Park in Indianapolis. This is a shot from game day. Alonzo Goldsberry passed to George Stazan for an early touchdown and Elmer Roll scored two more TDs before the half when all the scoring was done. Wabash collected 14 first downs, DePaul had but one picked up on a little giant penalty. Within a few months, Wabash fans had something else to celebrate as the college's basketball team won a national championship. The fall of 1922 brought a new football coach to DePaul. James Ashmore came from the University of Iowa, where he was head basketball coach. This photo shows the Tigers scoring their first touchdown of the season versus Milliken. Here's a snapshot from the team's 34-7 loss to Notre Dame. Students of the era attended Daily Chapel in Meharry Hall and seemed to take their botany experiments to extremes. DePaul was 4-2-2 heading into the Wabash game. The Little Giants were 6-3 entering the season-ending battle with three All-State players and triumphs over Michigan State and at Purdue seen here. On November 4th, big world news, Howard Carter discovered King Tut's tomb. Exactly three weeks later, students from both schools got gussied up and made the drive to Irwin Field in Indianapolis for a game which was scoreless at halftime. Whatever Wabash coach Pete Vaughn said during the break worked. The Little Giants roared in the second half, with William Singleton scoring two touchdowns. The fearsomely named Tiny Knee took a kickoff return all the way for another score, seen here. And Wabash nailed the door shut in the fourth quarter when Elvin Elliott scooped up a block punt and scored. That headline could have read, Tuttle Domination. In a year when Time Magazine published its first issue and the portable radio was launched, and yes, that's it there, DePauw and its faculty celebrated a record enrollment of 1,516 students. The football Tigers opened the season by defeating Indiana University for the first time since 1896. At Wabash, coach Pete Vaughn had lost four all-star players from his 1922 team, but this little giant squad was not rolling over. They tied Purdue, and a week before the DePaul game, waylaid IU 29-6. With the experiment of playing the rivalry contest in Indianapolis over, in November 1923, DePaul fans boarded the Monon to ride the rails from Greencastle to Crawfordsville. A sustained first quarter drive by Wabash led to a Freddie Wyatt touchdown. William Singleton added another score in the second quarter, and DePaul didn't have a single first down in the first half. With a victory, Wabash closes the season with a 4-3-2 record, while DePaul goes 4-2-1. Greencastle marked its centennial in 1924 with a big parade. A variety of floats and vintage vehicles filled the downtown area, rolling past the local opera house. DePaul's cheerleading squad spent the fall searching for new ways to form human pyramids, while the Tiger football team kept finding new ways to lose. Head coach James Ashmore abruptly left the team in mid-season and was replaced by his assistant Guy Morrison. DePaul came into the Wabash game with a 1-5 record and had been outscored 151-30. Foes included Indiana, Purdue, and Illinois. The Little Giants were 4-4 four four, but also played some heavy hitters. This shot is from the 21-7 loss to Purdue. Notre Dame and its four horsemen prevailed in South Bend 34-0. And here's proof that bulletin board material is not a recent phenomenon. In the first quarter of the rivalry game, a Wabash pass intended for Elvin Elliott was deflected and landed in Fred Wyatt's hands for a touchdown. Later, two runs for scores by Wyatt and Dana Gibson made it 21-0. 
DePaul had a first and goal from the Little Giant one-yard line, but the men in red held and logged another shutout. In 1925, people lined up for lessons as a new dance craze, the Charleston, swept America. A new president was inaugurated at DePauw, Lemuel Merlin, an 1891 graduate of the university who had led Boston University for 13 years. A good workout in Bowman Gym, a restful sleep, or even a giddy moment couldn't make students forget that it had been four years since they'd defeated their arch rivals in football. At 2-4-1 heading into the big game, the Tiger prospects seemed bleak. Wabash came in at 4-3-1, with one of their wins coming against Purdue. On game day, DePaul sent a 60-member band and more than half of its student body to Crawfordsville. A furniture store offered a free turkey to the first Wabash player to score a touchdown. Dana Gibson, Wabash halfback, was the lucky recipient. He rambled more than 50 yards for pay dirt after grabbing an interception and was given the live bird after the game. Things got so comfortable for the Little Giants that Coach Pete Vaughn took a seat on the sidelines. On this day, for the first time ever, Vaughn employed a huddle to call plays, and virtually everything worked. On a dry, sunny afternoon, Wabash scored 16 points in the first half while shutting out their visitors from the south yet again. When it was over, Tiger's smiles were forced after a fifth straight scoreless setback. Heading into the final game of the 1926 season, Wabash's 4-4 four four record was deceiving. The Little Giants had posted shutouts over Evansville, Ball State, and Butler. Three of their losses came to Purdue, Minnesota, and Illinois. The team's fighting spirit was personified by Gordon Helm, who played without a helmet long after headwear became standard gear. DePaul had battled to a 4-2-1 record. As student journalists geared up for a key annual assignment, fans gathered on campus lawns and street corners to discuss what-ifs, and Tiger supporters got fired up at a pregame pep rally. On a cold, rainy day, the winning drive was a long one. Wabash running backs Fred Stu Myers and Clarence Peace carried the ball for 43 yards and four first downs, culminating in a Myers touchdown plunge from one yard out with about three minutes to play. A desperate attempt by DePauw to even the score, led by Dick Sturtridge, came up 25 yards short of the goal line. The final chapter in this football season was again written in scarlet letters. For DePauw fans, it meant bring on basketball season. On September 30, 1927, the streets of Greencastle were buzzing with news that Yankee slugger Babe Ruth had clobbered his 60th home run of the season. But that fall, DePaul's football team wasn't setting any records. Coach William L. Hughes brought his team to Crawfordsville for the season's final battle with a 4-3 record. Captained by Perry Lower, Wabash was 6-2, with one of those setbacks coming at the University of Iowa. This contest stayed scoreless until just before halftime when coach Pete Vaughn sent in an entirely new backfield and the Little Giants started to rumble. A 40-yard completion for a touchdown gave the home team a lead. In the third quarter, a 60-yard DePaul drive ended with a scoring run by Don Brandenburg, marking the first time the Tigers had dented the scoreboard against their rivals since 1920. But a second Wabash touchdown in the game's final minutes produced a familiar outcome, a seventh straight Little Giant triumph in this series. Three weeks before the annual clash with Wabash, the 1928 Tigers, led by their coach William L. Hughes and seen in practice here, made the longest journey in the football program's history, traveling to West Point to play Army, a game DePaul lost 38 to 12. The following week, Army played Notre Dame in the legendary contest in which coach Newt Rockney successfully implored his squad to win one for the Gipper. Heading into the rivalry game, DePaul was five and two with the other loss to Purdue. Wabash was four, three and one, 
and was coming off a 14-0 setback in which they'd held the Boilermakers scoreless over the final three periods. When students weren't posing with their cars, climbing roofs, or creating other kinds of mischief, they were pinning their hopes on a victory over the other guys. The Little Giants scored two touchdowns in the first quarter on runs by Clayton Weist and Russell Hankins, after which, as a newspaper writer declared, they quit for the day. DePauw put seven points on the board in the second quarter on a Don Brandenburg run and 13 more in the third stanza. One on a fumble recovery in the Wabash end zone, another when Brandenburg grabbed a second fumble and raced in from 25 yards out. For the first time since 1920, bragging rights returned to Greencastle. As the Roaring Twenties ended, Wabash became the first Indiana college to play football under the lights. Every 1929 home game except the DePauw contest was played at night. The smiles and fancy duds in the Tiger grandstands were befitting a winning team. DePauw's October 19th game at Purdue's ross Aid Stadium became the first of three straight losses the Tigers suffered after winning their first three. Six days after the Boilermaker game, economic suffering hit home with what history recalls as Black Friday, the stock market crash that paved the way for the Great Depression. 29 days later, with America still reeling, an annual football rivalry was renewed. Reginald Sullivan, mayor-elect of Indianapolis and 1898 Wabash graduate, got out of his office and was on hand to see a game that DePauw was slightly favored to win. Pete Vaughn's three and five Little Giants got on the scoreboard first when DePauw's Guernsey Van Riper grabbed a punt and for some reason retreated into his team's end zone, leading to a safety. The visitors grabbed a lead in the third quarter when halfback Hugh Hogan hauled in a flat pass and rambled in for a touchdown. But halfway through the final period, Wabash mounted a drive that decided the outcome. On fourth and goal from the 10, Clayton Weist took a handoff shook off three Tiger tacklers and went into the end zone standing up. The vintage scoreboard shows the final tally. A new decade brought a new academic building to the DePauw campus. Asbury Hall was dedicated on June 7, 1930 and not long after, a new coach, Wabash graduate and former Little Giant assistant Raymond Gaumi Neal, began his first set of football practices at the Greencastle School. The Tigers made headlines in early November with a trip to Boston University, and a big crowd was on hand at the train station to welcome the Tigers home after they trounced their hosts 22 to seven. DePaul entered the Wabash game with a five and one record. The Little Giants had won their first three contests and then dropped five in a row. But three of those setbacks were the result of missed extra points. On the morning of the big game, Vandals painted the DePauw ticket booth red and, in a move that no doubt aided investigators, added the phrase, Wabash fans admitted free. A record crowd of 4,000 gathered at Blackstock Field and the fans wearing red were cheering early. In the first quarter, Wabash's Ralph Weingartner blocked the DePauw punt. It led to a touchdown, but the extra point attempt was, you guessed it, no good. In the fourth quarter, with 12 minutes to go, DePauw's Don Wheaton connected with Forrest Crane on a touchdown pass, and that tied things up. On the all-important extra point attempt, Wheaton fumbled a bad snap from center, but scooped the ball up and squirmed around the left end to give DePauw a one-point win. In the 1931 renewal of this rivalry, Wabash, led by future school Hall of Famers Harry Red Varner and Gary Vinroot, came in with a 3-4-1 record and hopes of ending the season on a high note. The Tiger faithful made their way to Crawfordsville, some by bus, others in what amounted to billboards on wheels. And the crowd witnessed a defensive struggle. Over the course of the afternoon, the teams punted 11 times each. A first quarter interception by Buzz Smith set up a Wabash touchdown and the home team held a 7-0 lead at halftime. 
In the third quarter, DePauw quarterback Don Wheaton scampered 15 yards around the right end for a touchdown, but Wheaton's extra point kick was no good. Still trailing by a point in the fourth quarter, Wheaton tossed a 35-yard touchdown pass to Robert Bradley, seen in this photo, and this time the extra point kick was good. For leading the Tigers to a 7-1 record, Wheaton was named All-State quarterback. United Press deemed him better than the signal callers at Notre Dame, Purdue, and IU, and he was named an honorable mention AP All-American. Forty-two years after DePauw and Wabash first met on the football field, the rivalry marched forward with a new prize. In 1932, the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville Railroad Company, also known as the Monon, donated one of its locomotive bells, which would, from this year forward, go to the winner of the annual game. The day before the contest, an article in the DePauw, which you can see in the left margin of this picture, called the new trophy the Victory Bell. Wabash, seen here in its 1932 team photo and in action earlier that season, came into the big game with a 4-2 and two record. DePaul was 3-4 and four on the season. This photo in particular shows the Tigers against Earlham. As you can see from DePaul's 1932 schedule, as well as the program, game day was also Dad's Day. After a week of snow and cold weather which forced the teams to practice indoors, Blackstock Field was streaked with frozen mud and ice and the footing was treacherous. In fact, crews worked two days straight clearing 12 inches of snow. DePaul's cheerleaders and 2,500 Chile fans witnessed a game that ended in a scoreless tie. There was some debate over which school would keep the new prize. One report indicated that Wabash tried to claim it. Since DePaul had won in 1931, the bell initially went to Greencastle. But legend has it, it remained in an undisclosed location until the two teams met again the following fall. Students of football history know this was a team for the ages. The 1933 DePauw Tigers were the nation's last college football team to complete a season undefeated, untied, and unscored upon. In their seven games, the Tigers outscored their opponents 136 to nothing. The Indianapolis News wrote at the time that the players under their beloved coach, Gaumi Neal, were always hustling for their jobs because of energetic reserves. Here was a thoroughly amateur college football team having a lot of fun Saturday after Saturday. Number 11, Mr. Walter Goes, the class of 36. Number 15, Bob Bradley, class of 35 from Fort Wayne, Indiana. 50 years after they made history, the men of the 1933 team reunited on Old Gold Day and a network television news crew captured the proceedings as the team members were introduced at Blackstock Stadium. They also gathered at the university's new athletic center, which they raised nearly $3 million to help build in honor of their coach, a Wabash graduate, whose name graces the field house. The secret of the, uh, the team was we didn't have any professionals. We were all out there to have fun. And uh, we had, one, we had the, the coach, a coach that all of us would uh, give our lives for. As Coach Neal's squad did every Saturday in 1933, a win was the result of the game in Crawfordsville, a shutout that determined the first outright winner of the Monon Bell after a tie the year before. These Tigers sealed their legend with a 14-0 triumph. In 1934, DePaul was enjoying a second consecutive undefeated season, winning six of their first seven games by shutouts, and had only given up six points all year, the first a Tiger squad had allowed since 1932. As the legendary Professor Henry B. Longdon prepared for his retirement, 
DePauw students cheered victory after victory and decorated their living units for Old Gold Day. On the Wabash campus, undergraduates had a 3-2-2 two, and two football team to cheer on and some pranks to pull before the big game. In the dead of the night, they painted red W's on DePauw's campus sidewalks as well as on the statue of the owl that guards historic East College. Bad weather was predicted for Monon Bell Saturday, but the game wound up being played under bright fall sunshine before 5,000 fans. The Little Giants took the lead in the second quarter when Herm Burns connected with William Bowie Snyder on a 58-yard touchdown pass. Paul Henry Mueller provided the extra point. In the fourth quarter, DePaul's Bob Fribley, seen in this photo from the game, scored from four yards out. But his attempt to run the ball in for the extra point was stopped short. It marked the first time in five tries that Wabash graduate and former assistant coach Gaumi Neal had been bested by his former teacher and boss, the veteran coach Pete Vaughn. In the 1930s, a rite of passage for Wabash men was the burning of the pots. Freshman fraternity pledges were required to wear their pots or beanies at all times during the year. They were then permitted to burn them to mark their promotion to sophomores. Heading into the football season's rite of passage, both the 1935 Little Giants and Tigers were red hot. Wabash was 6-1 and, and had outscored opponents 211-30. DePaul was 5-0-1, oh, but had several key injuries as they entered the battle for the bell, which was displayed in the back of a truck on game day. Tiger fans made their way to Crawfordsville aboard two special trains, one from Greencastle, the other from Indianapolis, along with a dollar round-trip bus. A crowd totaling 3,000 gathered on a cold day at a muddy Ingalls Field. Most of the game was played in the middle of the turf, although Wabash got as close as DePaul's 15-yard line. On the game's final play, DePaul's Hal Hickman intercepted a Wabash pass at the Tiger 20-yard line. And this one ended with the scoreboard showing the same numbers as when it started. As Wabash students looked forward to the 1936 version of their football rivalry with DePauw, they had plenty of reason for optimism. The Little Giants were 6-1 with their lone defeat and 8-7 loss to Butler. To the south, there wasn't a whole lot for the Tiger Band or any fans to beat the drum over. Three wins, two losses, and two ties were on the Tigers' ledger before the season-ending game. A Monon Bell advertisement promised a game of thrills for a dollar and ten cent bleacher seat that would have bought 11 gallons of gasoline back then. On this day, three men made sure the Bell would remain at Wabash. Sophomore quarterback William Pack threw two touchdown passes to senior Lenny Wolf, and John White returned a punt 88 yards for a score. Wabash students were rewarded for the win with an extra day tacked on to Thanksgiving break. Having been victorious in just one of the first five battles for the Monon Bell, the Tigers were prowling for momentum and piling up wins in the fall of 1937. They knocked off Ball State on Old Gold Day 13-0 and came into the Wabash game 6-1 with their only loss to Butler University. The Little Giants, led by senior halfback Dick Cooney, had played Butler to a scoreless tie in front of 8,000 people. Crippled by injuries and with only one 200-pound player on the roster, Wabash was 3-2-2 two, and two before a game that even got the attention of a local movie house. The Bell Contest was also homecoming for the men from Crawfordsville. Wabash fumbled early and never regained their footing. Led by Captain Jack Oswald, DePaul scored one touchdown in each of the first three quarters and added two in the final stanza. The result was the rivalry's biggest margin of victory in 25 years. The fall of 1938 marked the 50th full multi-game season for DePaul's football program. It started with three games, which the Tigers won by a combined score of 101-6. to 
This vintage film archives the October 1st, 1938 dismantling of Evansville. The Tigers logged some impressive scores in this game, which the home team won 41 to nothing. The DePaul band and fans marched through the streets of downtown Indianapolis before the Butler game, which began a parade of three losses for the black and gold. A win over Earlham made the Tigers 4-3 and three before the big annual grudge match. Wabash, on the other hand, was 1-5-1. and one. The Little Giants scored just eight points in their first six games. The week before the Bell Battle, they logged their first victory, a 32-14 triumph over Rose Polly. On the bright side, the Crawfordsville campus's newest addition, Goodrich Hall, opened. It boasted modern facilities for the teaching of physics and chemistry. On Monon Saturday, Elmer Botkin, who played center for the Tigers in 1889, returned a half century later to see what this game was all about. A Wabash fumble at their own 45-yard line led to the contest's only scoring drive, culminating in a two-yard scamper around the left end by the Tigers' Johnny Scott. DePaul amassed 258 yards from scrimmage on the day to the Little Giants' 95 and had 14 first downs compared to three. Joe Barr, who later became U.S. Treasury Secretary, posed with the winner's bounty after this one was over. These vintage photographs from the fall of 1939 show DePaul coach Gaumi Neal putting his troops through their paces in practice and the Tigers enjoying some hard-earned R&R. DePaul, seen here against Ohio Wesleyan in 1939, came into the battle for the Bell with three wins, three losses, and one tie. Under coach Pete Vaughn, Wabash had a three, four, and one record. That takes us to game day. Newspaper accounts report that DePaul sent 18 players to Crawfordsville for the contest, and it turned out to be a tough defensive struggle. The lone score came when DePaul's Art Lavage threw a touchdown pass to team captain Joe Edwards. The 1930s end with a second consecutive 7-0 DePaul victory and the Tigers celebrating possession of the Monon Bell for a third straight year.